Welcome to the September 2022 broadcast of the Plastec Academy, where we encourage your personal knowledge and career development. This webinar series is hosted by the Plastec Group with the intention to provide a free professional resource to connect you with the current best practices, operations, and trends every month. My name is Nicole Freeman, Corporate Marketing Coordinator for the Plastec Group and moderator of the Plastec Academy webinar series. We appreciate you taking the time to join us here today, so let's get started with today's message. As a world-class supplier and global manufacturer of fast-moving consumer goods, the Plastec Group respects the value that our world-leading clients place on timeliness. From ideation, proposals, to contracts, to production, we are committed to providing a five-star experience. But there's just one more piece of the overall logistics of a customer's product order. The final step in time here is getting the finished goods into our clients' hands just as fast as consumers purchase your FMCG brands from the store shelves. Therefore, upon completion of manufacturing, every order suitable to each client's unique specifications, the Plastec Group standard for delivery is no exception. How do we address this, you might ask? When it comes time to prepare our customers' orders for shipment, our procurement specialists and warehouse teams work together closely to coordinate all communications for shipping and receiving activity. Plastic utilizes a combination of in-house, third-party, or by-the-customer dispatching arrangements. Now, you might be asking yourself, which strategy is the best practice? You may be recalling a less than satisfactory experience on both sides of the table, or the last headache that you were called to mitigate between a third party vendor. Well, no matter the size of your logistics transportation needs, delegating to a trusted outsourced expert can in fact be a positive resource. So for today's webinar, we'll introduce you to one of our valued partners to represent an example of this third party relationship. Global Trans has and continues to provide motor freight by land services for the Plastec Group for approximately seven years. Coordinating the dispatch schedules for on average of 10 truckloads a week from north to south and east of the Mississippi. Global Trans has provided exceptional customer service with knowledgeable and experienced agents and drivers. Our procurement, shipping and receiving teams describe their interaction with Global Trans with words such as motivated, appreciation, react quickly, opportunities, committed and collaborative. With all that said, it's now my pleasure to introduce you to our guest speakers, Jeff Greenwell and Sun Penn. Guys, it's time to share what you do best and please help us all make sense of logistics. Thanks, Nicole. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you, Jeff. Okay, oh, here we go. All right, well, good morning and thank you everyone for joining and Nicole, thank you and Plastic for having us. So today we're gonna to talk about making sense of logistics. We're gonna cover a lot of ground. Uh, essentially what we're gonna do is make a quick introduction, talk about a little bit of logistics, the overview, uh, then we'll get into some global logistics, regional and domestic, and we'll wrap that up. Uh, some will wrap up with solutions that can be implemented to manage uh, your customer supply chains and help solve for some of those solutions. So uh, again, good morning. My name is Jeff Greenwell. I am the Vice President of Enterprise Growth here at Global Trans, responsible for our customer-facing teams. Son? 
Yep. I'm Sun Ten, uh, you know, Senior Director of Customer Solutions. Very nice to be here. All right. So we have a lot to cover here. Let's get started. So as a definition, uh, it's, it's this is a simple definition of logistics, and I like to keep it even simpler by saying if it didn't grow there, it was delivered there. Uh, and that could be by train, by boat, by plane, by truck. Uh, I think we can all agree, though, that logistics is the physical uh, movement of goods from raw materials to finished goods. Um, by way of size, uh, the global logistics industry is valued at just over $6 trillion. That's expected to be just under $8 trillion by uh, 2027. Roughly about a trillion and a half of that is spent here in the United States. So if logistics is uh, the movement of goods, the supply chain is the network in which those goods are moved. So if we look at a very, very basic level here, uh, we see we have raw goods, raw materials all the way on the left, all the way to the consumer on the right. And you know, many times we think about the retailer piece of this, uh, where we buy our stuff and not necessarily all the components that are used to make up that stuff and, and how they come together. So if you think about the movement of those goods all across this continuum and think about all the different places they come from, all the different modes that they ship by, there's a lot of room for error and a lot of areas where we can encounter challenge. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that today and then wrap it up again with how we can mitigate some of that. So the various modes of, of, uh, of transportation within the supply chain network, we essentially use four main modes of transportation over the road, such as dry vans and refrigerated units, which is essentially a dry van with a refrigerator on it, um, as well as various types of flatbeds. Um, in the rail and intermodal realm, we use uh, trailers, we use uh, containers, uh, uh, TOFC, which is a trailer on a flatbed car. Within the ocean, of course, there are uh, ports, there are drage trucks in and out of the ports, uh, there are the vessels themselves, and then, of course, airplanes with air. Um, air would be used when the product must get there, right? If there's a, um, some sort of an emergency, it's an expensive alternative, but it's the fastest delivery method that we have. And each of these modes actually sort of presents a unique set of benefits and challenges in and of itself. So we'll take a look at the global supply chain. This is, it's a great slide. It's a little bit busy, I understand that, but this depicts the shipping routes of the world. Uh, these are these are all across the globe, right? This is various modes, whether it's air uh, or, or by uh, sea. Uh, top exporters would be China and Japan, among others. Top importers would be, of course, us and China, among others. Uh, we will discuss some of the challenges in this network uh, in a minute here. But I want to just kind of give some color to this. Just the sheer volume of cargo on the water or in the air at any one time is, is massive. Um, if you think about the Panama Canal, right? Uh, there are about 40, 41 ships, container ships that pass through the Panama Canal every day of the year. And on average, each of those ships carries about 24,000 containers or TEUs, which is a 20-foot equivalent unit. So just in the Panama Canal alone, we have almost a million containers a day coming through there um, and going you know, to and from various ports of the world. So really impressive the amount of, of uh, goods, cargo that is shipped throughout the world on any given day. So I mentioned a minute ago about some of the challenges and pitfalls that uh, sort of apply to all the puzzle pieces within the network. And these are a few of the challenges which face the industry today. There are more uh, p political unrest, uh, war such as we've had recently in Ukraine, uh, embargoes or even more disruptive features. Um, we're still seeing lingering effects of COVID with shutdowns in China causing port delays, uh, sending manufacturers and retailers kind of scrambling to find alternatives uh, to get goods in, 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 uh, um, across the globe. Also, there's been a shift in the economy or, or in consumer buying patterns. That's very taxing on global logistics. So if you think about pre-COVID, consumers spent money on experiences like going to a movie or going out to dinner or buying clothes for work, something like that. That all shifted to stuff, really. If you think, you know, if you're stuck at home, why not buy that new couch or that new washer or dryer? Or why not remodel that bathroom, right? So now we're seeing a lot of volatility uh, in the supply chain because we're sort of in this transition back to pre-COVID to, to having experiences, people can take vacations, you can go out to dinner, you can do all the things that you were doing before. But that's really, um, it's, it's a mid-financially uncertain time. So it's, it's creating a lot of uh, turmoil within the supply chain. 
So if you think about like, if I could give one example of, of a, a, an industry that would be affected by all these challenges, I think about automotive, right? Um, so I think about the shortage of chips in, in cars, that leads to potentially you know, wasted technology, that, that leads to uh, uh, potentially dissatisfied manufacturers and more, more importantly, dissatisfied uh, consumers, loss of revenue, last minute changes in planning and setting the right expectations. Through all of that, it's a very real challenge that uh, shippers face today. And really a lot of this was around even pre-COVID, it's just been exacerbated by the, the disruption of, of the pandemic. So to sort of tie that together, this is a great, uh, a great example. We've discussed sort of the types of the modes, we've discussed the global shipping routes and potential challenges. This is a good example to bring it all together that I think everyone can relate to is, is the smartphone, right? So we see here um, on the screen, you know, there's a collection of parts from around the world. So we see everything from display port interfaces to processors and the screen itself. And those come from various regions such as Europe and the US and Asia. So everything has to come together in a timely fashion um, to, to build that, that smartphone and have it ready for a new model launch or the subsequent sales that might follow that. So think about the phone in your pocket. Um, it took materials, it took labor, it took planning and logistics from around the world just to get that device to your local store for purchase. That's pretty amazing. So taking a closer look at transportation by sea, this, this graphic shows uh, the top 20 ports in the US, the largest are on the West Coast and Northeast, but we also see the Southeast and the Pacific Northwest growing, especially during the, the, the post pandemic rebuild uh, to get product back on shelves, get parts back to manufacturers. About 40% of the US international trade value is hauled on a maritime vessel. So during the pandemic where we saw lots of backups in Long Beach and Los Angeles, um, there were you know ships waiting out on ocean to get in, some of them were diverted to Tacoma, Seattle. Some of them were diverted to other ports just to make sure that we could get uh, product off. So these are ocean metrics that um, we follow to give a good idea of what's happening on the water. To the left, we have the, the Freitos Baltic Index. And, and uh, this is, it measures the average cost of a container globally. And they can also break it down into various maritime lanes, but it's updated daily. And, and we watch these trends typically on a monthly basis. It's a, the index is known to be a solid indicator um, of volume to come. So when, when prices begin to spike, we typically see container volumes increase at the ports within a few weeks. And it's a little difficult to see this, but two years ago, you could move a, a container from China to the West Coast of the United States for a couple thousand dollars. Um, during the pandemic and post pandemic, there was a shift in the balance of containers that became harder to get in traditional locations. So when China shut down, manufacturers had to look elsewhere to source uh, materials. And so there was this imbalance created of containers all over the world. That price spiked, the average price spiked to over $12,000 per container. And in some lanes, it was as high as $16,000 and $18,000 per container. Um, it has since come down with volume and things getting somewhat back to normal. It's that price now on average is about $4,800 this week. And the next two graphs, uh, they show, um, basically inbound container activity and, and import shipments, right? They're both lower um, as expected, but the real key takeaway here is, is look at the volatility. It's tough to plan manufacturing, marketing, sales, et cetera, uh, and especially logistics when that activity is so sporadic. Here's another uh, report that we use. This is this is really, this is a free report that's put out. This is called the signal. This, this tells us what's going on at the Port of Los Angeles. The Port of Long Beach has their own called the wave. Um, but essentially this projects the number of containers due uh, into the port. So you think about how volatile last year was, and then you look at, and this, is, this one's dated, but I can give you the updated numbers. The current week is um, projected to be up about 12% year over year. So even more containers than what we had last year coming into the port of, uh, of Los Angeles in this uh, example. Next week, that's projected to be 15% year over year, but the following week, it comes down. It's supposed to be, uh, it's projected to be uh, down 21% year over year. So these numbers fluctuate every week, but it's a, it's a good measure of activity. And then any of that activity that affects the ports, when there's more activity at the port, more inland transportation, such as trucks, is needed to to uh, to transport goods across the country, and so you get this imbalance then of capacity within the U.S. 
and then that can affect availability and it can affect pricing. So there's a lot that goes that goes into that. This is uh, a, another look at the ocean challenges. On the left, we see what was a bottleneck at the ports. Pre-COVID, ports unloaded about, at least the, the LA unloaded about 10 ships a day. That spiked as the volumes grew to refill inventories and that the, the graph on the right shows the waiting time. So um, we are typically seeing right now about a one day wait for a vessel on the water to get a berth spot at the at the port. Um, during the peak of, of the of the re-inventory uh, phase, we were seeing ships wait at bay 20, 30 days. It wasn't uncommon to see that. So the challenge really, whether it's a pandemic or, or perhaps a strike, is that if product's on a ship and it's sitting in the bay, that's not product on the shelf for sale and it's not parts necessary for manufacturing being delivered to any one location. We look at the major airports, uh, call out to Memphis for obvious reasons there. Um, as of 2020, there were about 850 uh, cargo planes in the US commercial freight uh, fleet hauling about $44 billion in cargo. This is, you know, I mentioned earlier that it's it's a it's an expensive way to go, potentially depending on what you're you're, you're uh, shipping, but it's the fastest way to go, and that's that's a lot of how we get next day delivery, or uh, you can you can get on your favorite website and order something and have it at your house in a, in a day or less. So transition a little bit and narrow our scope and look at regional or North American logistics. This slide depicts two of the top three trading partners of the U.S., and they happen to be our neighbors, Mexico and, and Canada, uh, China being the third. Most of the freight between the three travels by rail and truck. So to give you uh, an example of, of how much cargo is between these three countries, in January of this year alone, we imported $113 billion of goods from Canada and Mexico. These are some of the challenges that exist. Um, you know, challenges to regional uh, uh, shipping and regional logistics include all of these. An example of something we don't always hear about, though, or might might not always make the news or might be back page of the news, is something like the the third bullet here, the cartel threat. Um, avocados in particular have been affected by by drug cartels, something that we wouldn't necessarily think about. In in 2021, there was uh, violence that was threatened against the U.S. Uh, produce inspector, which caused a ban on avocados from Mexico for a, for a short time. But panic buying ensued, much like everything else uh, during the pandemic, and the price of avocados went up. And we looked to source avocados from different areas. Now we get avocados from Mexico, as well as other countries like Peru. And that's just one example of how world effects or world events can affect logistics as we move to find alternative sources for goods. Politics, uh, vaccine mandates different in Canada, different in Mexico. It, it, uh, it disrupts the border and how cargo and goods flow between the three countries. Uh, the Canadian uh, trucker protest that I'm sure everyone heard about that lasted for a long time. These are all challenges that the logistics industry has had to work around in order to deliver goods. Okay, so this map is of the North American rail system. There are class one railroads, there are short haul railroads that make up a network of, of the rail system. Uh, many items such as cars that ride the rails from Mexico to US, coal is another large commodity shipped via rail. Rail is a very efficient way to move goods cheaply. Uh, it takes more time than over the road, but it's uh, it, it's, it offers a good alternative for many commodities. Intermodal is also a popular way to ship goods and intermodal involves picking up a, a, a container with a truck and a chassis, delivering that to the railroad. It moves along the railroad. On the other end of that, it's picked up uh, by another truck and chassis and it's delivered to the final location. About 14 million units were delivered by rail in, in 2021. But an, an example, actually we have a very timely example um, of potential disruption that, that for the rail just came this week. We uh, were on the verge of a strike, which would have put a major dent in domestic logistics. That strike was averted. Um, a tentative agreement was announced this morning. And so we, we don't believe that that's going to happen now, um, which is good news, right? Because that would, the estimates were something like a $2 billion impact to logistics, but 
even more than the than the the financial impact is just the ability to have the capacity it really would have taxed our truckload capacity in the united states and that really would have affected delivery of again goods and and uh, parts and, and materials to people that really need to get them for manufacturing and for sales so we'll dive now into domestic transportation this is this will help kind of bring it home this is a look at the the u.s uh it's the top one percent trade corridors in the u.s based on truck this is about a decade old but they don't typically change um, the the dots you can see the various dots on the map the size of the dot depicts the size of the city and this is uh generally the the population centers or we might call them user centers, right? So if you think about an, in, an imbalance of, we talked about a global imbalance of containers, for example, think about a global or a domestic imbalance of trucks. A place like New York City, a lot of trucks have to go to New York City in order to deliver goods, but not a lot of goods are coming out of New York City. And so the cost of that truck would, would be more to go in and less to come out because you have an over, you have more capacity that needs to come out uh, that that needs to be uh, needs to be paid to come out of that location. So this this map here just creates its own set of of unique challenges for us to be able to deliver for customers to say, okay, well, how do we ensure that we have trucks across the United States um, in order to to fulfill the needs of our customers when we know that a lot of them might be in the east, a lot of them might be in the west, and then we think about things, um, you know, if if God forbid a a hurricane hits the Gulf Coast. A lot of that capacity is then pulled south and initially in something like that you would see uh, dry vans and you would see reefers sent down for food for water things like that then it starts to eat up some of the flatbed capacity as they start to come in and rebuild and construction materials are taken to those areas that's just one example of how there can be some real disruption uh, in areas such as that So some of you may have seen these graphs before. These uh, depict the current state uh, of the domestic landscape. The top graph is an index that's updated daily. Uh, it shows tender volume in the United States. And during the craze of last year, the index ramped up to over 16,000. Today, it's around 12,500. The index itself is pegged at 10,000, which was uh, where it started in March of 2018 when the index was created. So if, if we think about the volatility and up and down, and again, you can see uh, the dips there. Most of the big dips come at the holidays, so, but, but moreover, just the, the trend line of, of volume coming down in the United States is what I want to get at here. Uh, essentially showing, again, that slowdown, um, which we're seeing, but this also can have a positive effect on capacity to a point. So when, when volume slows, trucks in particular are easier to come by uh, intermodal is a little bit easier to come by. However, at some point there, there's this inflection point where there's a race to the bottom for pricing and that can have a negative longer term effect on available capacity because you could have uh, smaller carriers go out of business. You know, when we think about the, just in particular the truckload landscape in the United States, that includes everything from owner operators who might be one person with one truck all the way up to very large, you know, uh, fleets of trucks. And so the, the impact of of everything uh you know pricing and volume and the ability to get uh goods and transport them on your truck uh, because we like to say that you know trucks don't make money unless the wheels are turning uh that can affect the capacity because if you don't have uh, a customer that's giving you freight a lot of the smaller carriers will exit the network this bottom graph shows the average rate per mile on a rolling seven day average for the last year uh, just again, the volatility is what I really want to get out of this. At the height, this was over uh, 3.75 a mile. Today, it's around a dollar less than that. But this is an average, so keep in mind this. This really depends on many variables, which can affect the price of any given shipment. So some of the uh, examples and challenges of things that uh, that hit the domestic transportation. We, we've talked a little bit about it, but domestic transportation is impacted by fuel, uh, not having enough drivers, increasing driver pay for over the road, insurance costs for carriers to be able to have, uh, have enough uh, insurance to cover themselves, and an increase in insurance requirements from shippers. Um, you know, this 
this idea of driver shortage and, and having drivers and seats has been an issue that really has been uh, it, it's been a challenge for logistics since I've been in logistics. I've been doing this for 24 years and we've talked about this a long time. I think the pandemic really opened up our eyes to not only driver pay, but the importance of drivers uh, in particular in logistics professionals uh, uh, in particular in the United States. And so there's been talk recently uh, to lower the age of getting a CDL to 18 from 21. That would open up a bigger pool of available drivers and talent to bring into the, the industry. Um, other modes and, and other, other challenges that we might have would be strikes. We talked about a strike earlier with the railroad. Uh, weather can affect all of these modes. Uh, produce season, if you, if you look at the map of the United States, produce generally starts earlier in the year in the southern states. And as the growing uh, season moves north with the weather, uh, each one of those loca locations that are known produce locations tend to eat up some of that capacity that's out there uh, in the network. And so produce season can have an impact on the availability of capacity and the rate of that capacity as well. Uh, government regulations also, uh, you know, we won't go into specifics, but there are a lot of regulations that have to do with uh, logistics and transportation in the U.S. Some of them very good and some of them have an impact that could potentially be negative. So we've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, we, we've covered it in a short time. We've talked about logistics around the globe. We've talked about uh, logistics here at home. We've talked about challenges for the logistics industry. And next up, Sun's gonna bring it home and provide some examples of how we can mitigate those risks and help smooth out the bumps on the road. Sun? Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, awesome overview of logistics at a, at a high level and a uh, great job uh, highlighting some of the key challenges um, that companies are facing in today's market, right? Um, you know, it's constantly changing, very uh, fluid, uh, and I'm sure, you know, the majority of everybody that's sitting on today's call has experienced this over the last couple of years. Um, you know, our focus as a logistics management company is to really introduce simplicity into your business. You know, you, you all have priorities, um, you know, so you shouldn't really have to focus on uh, spending unnecessary time uh, managing your logistics network, right? Um, you know, so over the next few slides, you know, I'll introduce you to our managed transportation solution and, and hopefully just share a little bit about how we support some of our customers. You know, by, by partnering with us, it, it gives our shippers a higher level of confidence in executing, you know, their supply chain strategy. You know, to start, what is managed transportation? You know, it, to, to me, it's, it's really, you know, simple. It's, it's a support model that empowers us as your logistics partner to, to really act in, as an extension to your supply chain. You know, it's gonna include, you know, uh, things like uh, planning and execution of your transportation, uh, order or shipment management, um, you know, track and tracing, exception management for claims and so forth. Um, all the way through to like financial reconciliation, you know, so it's essentially the entire shipment life cycle that we are helping to manage on your behalf. Um, you know, with, with every customer kind of having, you know, their own real unique characteristics and profiles, um, you know, this framework offers more of a module type of solution design that enables uh, you to really kind of pick and choose, you know, what's really needed across the different services that we do offer. You know, so from that vantage point, it allows you to be a little bit more agile, right, and maintain core aspects of your business, you know, while outsourcing things that aren't truly core competencies for, for, for you guys, right? So if you don't have in-house, you can leverage, you know, a company like ours or other partners out there um, to really supplement uh, your day-to-day. Um, you know, from a, a core capability standpoint, you know, there's always going to be some aspects of managed transportation that kind of apply to everybody, regardless of your profile. Um, that's going to include, you know, like in-house tactical operations, right? So these are the folks that are planning and executing and optimizing on your behalf on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, everyone's going to get, you know, the TMS technology, the back end support and the front end UI uh, to really help improve efficiencies uh, within the system in an automated fashion. Um, and you're going to get visibility, right? So this is visibility from, you know, the physicality and geographical nature of where are my loads today? Are they close to my customers? Um, and from a financial control standpoint, you know, how much, uh, you know, spend do I have in my network today? And can I actually actively control that spend um, as we're trying to make sure, uh, you know, business is profitable 
and you, you know you're making the right decisions in your network. Um, you're also going to get you know things like uh, business intelligence, right? So one of the the core things that we're offering is uh, you know through Power BI is interactive uh, reporting and analytics. Um, you know, in a, in a very simplistic manner, it's it's allowing you to touch and feel what's going on in your network without overcomplicating using you know spreadsheets for reporting, right? It's, it's an interactive feel, um, a lot of visuals to help kind of get to the point of what's going on um, in today's business. Um, and then you kind of wrap all of that up in strategic account management, right? So as you come on board into like a managed setting, um, you know, it, it's really about you know, having a team of people and a point person to lead the account to continue to build the relationship and continue to um, drive improvements, uh, you know, on your behalf. You know, so the pandemic, as mentioned by Jeff uh, a few different times throughout uh, his section, um, you know, created huge disruption across the globe, right? So again, this, this created a lot of volatility uh, in the transportation market that made it's extremely difficult for shippers to secure capacity. In other words, capacity is trucks, space on trucks and available trucks. Um, and, uh, you know, that was across carriers across all different modes, right? So it, it put a lot of upward pressure on pricing. Um, and I'm sure if anybody was uh, involved in, you know, making those decisions or trying to move cargo uh, over the past couple of years, um, you probably felt that it was hard, it was hard to get the right space at the right time for the right price. Um, you know, so essentially many shippers, you know, found themselves in a situation, uh, you know, where they had little control. Um, you know, domestically, the carrier market is, is still very much fragmented. Um, you know, so whether it's working across, you know, our 30,000 truckload carriers, you know, as, as mentioned before, they could be really like, you know, a fleet of two, three, four, five, ten, or hundreds. Of, of trailers, um, you know, or or along the lines of our you know, 120 plus LTL carriers that we work with, you know, working and being a 3PL uh, kind of helps break down that barrier and give you access to a larger pool of capacity, you know, nationwide, um, you know, and it creates a little bit more stability in your network. So you're not always having to think about, well, if I can't get space on this one carrier, what do I do next, right? So, um, you know, regardless of, you know, the size of your business, you know, if you're thinking to yourself, is this right for me or how could I leverage this? You know, using a 3PL partner to uh, manage or supplement even um, your network is always a great way to keep product flowing to your customers. That's, that's kind of the, the key there. You know, so as, as you assess, you know, your own transportation processes, you, you probably want to consider, um, you know, some of these benefits that are outlined on this page. Um, you're always, you know, typically going to get some sort of tech technology that drives, you know, more efficiencies across the processes, right? And, you know, you'll see from a variety of different providers, including ourselves, um, you're going to get, you know, everything down to like, you know, simplified booking and quoting process, right? That eliminates those phone calls, eliminates the manual process and really automates, you know, document creation. You know, do you have to cut a bill of lading or do you have to hand write it, right? Or is it automated on the system, uh, you know, reducing the time spent, um you know on on those processes you know you're going to have again access to the broad carrier network right so it's it's part of our uh network that you guys have tapped into um you know that, that's that's a big piece of it right and you're also going to get improved trans uh transparency and visibility right so again at a click of a button you know where your goods are and you know what's in transit and you can you know figure out how to um, capture, you know, as much revenue to grow your business as possible by ensuring that you know goods are being delivered and you can recognize that revenue from a financial standpoint. Um, you know, aside from some of the, the basic benefits that we do have outlined uh, on this slide, you know, you can really take full advantage of your logistics partner through like system integrations, for example, um, or order management processes, uh, you know, to really allow for like mode and carry agnostic load optimization um, within that planning and execution process. Um, you know, the big thing I think here is, you know, this just takes the burden off of, you know, your teams and, you know, puts it in the hands of, you know, operators that are really living and breathing this on a day-to-day -day basis, right? We know what we're doing. We have teams that are focused on, on, on your business and moving cargo for you um, safely and effectively. 
you know, and, you know, this is really my closing slide. So I know I didn't have a lot of content to cover here, but I just really wanted you to come out with, you know, an idea of, okay, you talked a little bit about logistics. You talked about managed transportation and how we support customers. Um, here's kind of a, a different aspect of what we would do. So I just wanted to share this case study um, that may resonate with some of the audience that are on the call today. You know, um, as a managed trans customer, um, you know, our commitment is to work with you and for you on your behalf to continually, you know, drive, you know, process and network improvement, period, right? So, um, you know, this is an example here that you're looking at um, that is, uh, you know, for a larger consumer goods customer that really had grown to the point where um, they just no longer felt like they had control of their network, right? They were a company that grew through, you know, a lot of acquisitions uh, quickly, um, which in as a byproduct created a lot of redundancies and inefficiencies. Um, you know, they, they knew that we were offering, you know, additional like value add services, like consulting solutions, you know, like in this case, it was network optimization. Um, so, you know, we, we typically went through, you know, our normal process, right? So we sat down with them, went through our discovery process to understand current state, um, you know, some of their problems and ultimately what they wanted to get out of this review, right? You know, so the main goal here was just simply to lower overall landed cost right while being able to support their customer demand right so um you know with these basic goals in mind you know we we're able to analyze you know their customer demand profile and kind of got down into it and said you know what do we have to do to help our customer out so we did site rationalization analysis which really helped determine where the could the goods could be housed um, across the various networks um you know we we did some review on how many sites were required um, understanding constraints and limitations um, to, to service their customer profile, and then also where those sites should be housed uh, and located, right? All while maintaining, you know, transit commitments to their customers. Um, you know, the gist was we, they didn't want to go over uh, their current commitments, so at the least uh, keep it uh, status quo while seeing what other improvements uh, could be a result, right? So. Um, yeah, in a nutshell, you know, this improved customer lead times, uh, you know, I think 17% of our, the, the customers within scope uh, saw a lead time improvement from like the upper three days down to one to two day transit, right? So um, from a footprint and network uh, footprint standpoint, we were able to identify three locations that were really underutilized um, and, and really kind of redundant in terms of where they were located. Um, so we're able to, you know, make a proposal to um, consolidate, uh, you know, the inventories at those facilities into um, a couple other locations. Um, and then ultimately, the, the big number really is, you know, landed cost improvement came down by like 7%. Um, you know, so again, really, this is just a high level. We didn't go into a whole lot of detail. Um, there's a lot there. Um, but, you know, this is the type of work that we love to do. And we love to be partners with our customers. Um, under our managed trans solution. Um, and no, it's really exciting. So I, I'm, I'm really thankful I had a chance to at least walk you through some of the high level details of what this could mean to you. Um, and that, that's really all I had for today. You know, I hope uh, this was able to give you somewhat of a glimpse into how we do currently support our customers and hopefully get you thinking a little bit about, you know, are, is there value for us? Uh, are these uh, topics and things that we haven't really talked about in your current business, and maybe you should, right? So um, I think if, if I've done that, we've done our job. So um, with that, I think uh, I'll, I'll kick it over to you, Nicole. Um, I think we can do some Q&A. Yeah, All right. Thank you, Sun, for kicking that over here and wrapping us up with the core Global Trans uh, a presentation today a lot of great content there and what a vast variety of audience members we have today um, so excited to see everyone on with us and we will be wrapping um, this session up here shortly we have about five minutes or so left in the session and then we'll wrap up with the conclusion we did have some questions on that so that's our first one answered for today um, while we give the guys a break, again, audience members, I want to just remind you, I see a lot of you may be visiting with the Plastic Academy for the first time and possibly go to webinar. 
So access your uh, dashboard there, and we are taking submitted questions at this time. So recap what we just went over. Think about your unique situations, um, what role you play in your organization, and how you can help um, manage your transportation needs and even overall customer service. Whether you are shipping out or receiving in, um, we're in a, a consumer world where, again, whether it's personal or business, we're all looking for something. So um, we'll give you a moment to do that there now. Um, we do also have some handouts today just provided by the Plastec Group. Um, as I'm sure everyone is here to visit Global Trans's um, background, a little bit about the Plastec Group is there available for you in our handout section. <laughs> Um, so we'll kick things off, just kind of recapping uh, while we're waiting for a couple of questions to come in, what we went over today. Um, here in central U.S. with Jeff and the eastern coast with myself and Sun and Plastec here, we're approaching the autumn season. Um, however, globally, we all have one thing in common, okay? What does fall mean? We're falling into the fourth quarter of the year. Um, and I think traditionally, you know, we're all thinking about what next year is, um, our fiscal calendars and planning and, and getting ahead of the game. Um, along with the case studies that you guys shared and the graphs that you talked about on an overall yearly average, um, any further comments on what we might be looking for at the future, um, maybe as far as rates and getting in a trap. You know, right now, personally, we're all looking at the gas prices, uh, which does affect transportation. But personally, we're looking to pinch pennies. You know, do we go anywhere this weekend? Do we drive 20 minutes to save five cents on gas? Um, and sometimes we do fall into that trap. Uh, do you guys have any further comments on what's in the future to come and uh, the coming rates? Yeah, so no, I can I can take this one or at least start on this one. Um, so rates are all tied to the availability of capacity, right? And they're all, that's all tied to um, to the economy. When we talk about domestic rates, um, you know, one of the things that we see, first of all, I would say that in the next couple of quarters, at least, and I, I don't really want to look out much past that. If I could, I would have a much different job, I think. <laughs> but uh, you know, one thing that I would really um, I, I think in the next couple of quarters, we're going to see a little bit of the same. I think we're going to see a bit of cooling uh, of the rates. I think we're going to see a little bit more excess capacity and availability on that side of the business. But one thing that I would caution people about when it comes to the rates, and I'm glad this comes up because um, at times we see shippers who will come into these, because this is a cycle, right? The, the logistics is always a cycle. It's a two to three year cycle. It dips, capacity gets loose, rates go down, it gets tight rates go up, capacity gets tight, right? Um, so when these valleys or these dips come, we, we caution customers not to chase rates to the bottom because what ends up happening is sometimes providers will lower rates for right now and only, hold, we call them paper rates, right? They'll only hold those for a certain time if it meets the, the, the truck on that day, if it meets the network, if it meets a, a head haul or a back haul for that particular carrier. Um, and and what ends up happening is if you chase those rates to the bottom you give up the relationship with capacity that might be there for you when it gets tight and so we we will recommend to people create a partnership with your carriers so that you can work through certainly in in this time you should be seeing some rate concessions from your partners um, but i would not discount the partners that have been there with you in order to you know save that five cents or whatever it is that, that you might want to look at anything to add to that son yeah, I, I think the only thing to add to that, uh, very good point, um, that I would suggest is, you know, as you think through your uh, freight characteristics, your network and your business profile, you know, those are things that could definitely lead to a reversal of what you're seeing in the market, right? So um, as on the LTL front, for example, less than truckload, um, yeah, we are seeing prices come down, uh, but that's at a very macro level. You know, you, you could have a, a different profile where you need certain accessorials, inside delivery, lift gates, other things that create uh, the opposite effects potentially for a carrier. So 
Um, it's very situational. So the only thing that I would just probably recommend is, you know, as you think through this at a high level, try and get a little bit more granular with your partners um, or with us or whoever you're reaching out to to get just a little bit more informed about where your profile would sit in the grand scheme of things uh, before you kind of sign sign your name to a 4% reduction <laughs> for fiscal 2023, right? So um, just a little due diligence, I think will go a long way for you. All right, great guys, good news. Um, we're gonna wrap up with one more question here as we kind of bounce back to Jeff. We're gonna bounce back to Sun as his closing slides kind of um, incorporated a case study and an onboarding experience. Um, and thinking about how we word this here, um, today's information I think was also important to express to help anyone on any side of the table in any role understand what goes into again the challenges and all of the behind the scene things um, and I've had the benefit of seeing the sneak peek of everyone that we have on here today and all of those roles they might not all be in the procurement but they might have some level of um, impression in making the decision of do we do this in-house or third party um, or how do we prepare for an, um, an on-time shipment, again, whether we're shipping out or receiving outside of all those challenges. Um, for somebody who might be looking at all the headaches and just thinking like, well, I know it's in my control. I know I can just do it myself no matter how long it takes. Can you give any further comments on Global Trans's experience and with your clientele, first time users versus third party users. How many, what's the scale look like with your, your clients? And how do you comfort them saying, yes, it's okay to be a first time user versus somebody who is very knowledgeable of it, of being a third party user? Yeah, well, I, I could uh, jump on this one. We started off uh, for what we're seeing with our customer base. You know, it's it's a variety, right? There's there's no perfect type of shipper out there or customer of ours. Um, some people have dabbled into leveraging, you know, third party logistics companies and their platforms, um, and you know, sometimes they they feel like it's beneficial to their business. But again, it's 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 really about your business and your strategy. How do you want to spend your time? Where do you value? the time and the hours spent throughout your day to day. Um, is it growing your business or is it worrying about tracking and tracing and chasing down shipments, right? So this is what we do every day, all day long, right? So we're on the phone, <laughs> we're, we're tracking shipments for you. We are managing all of that. So our customers don't need to, right? It's just one less headache that they have to deal with. Um, and I think that alone for a lot of new customers of ours, whether they're small or large, um, is a benefit, right? So time is money. Um, so for us, it's just kind of opening the door to really put more simplicity in the process. Jeff, yeah, I <laughs> just to add to that too, that I think it's important for shippers to expect more value, right? So there are a lot of logistics companies out there, a lot of transportation providers across the globe. And, and there are many of them who can pick up a load and deliver a load, right? But all the things that we talked about today to educate the customer on why things are happening, why is that truck not on time, why is that container so expensive on the water, why is this air freight bill so high, those are things that you know come from from articulating value and educating the customers uh, w within you know their own four walls, right? For us to deliver information that you can take internally and have those conversations to say it, maybe our budget was impacted and here's why. Uh, we think those are important, and we think that those are things that a good partner should absolutely be uh, be providing for you. And if they're not, then you know, ask for it. Very good. Networking is key, and you know, it kind of everything we've said today wraps into a, a very common saying these days of "be kind." And you guys are there to answer the questions and help everybody do what they do best. And um, overall, again, another goal of the Plastic Academy is just to help make all of our industries run a little bit smoother so that we can enjoy life and enjoy the products that we're purchasing a little bit better and longer. So um, 
that was the last question that we are going to be able to take today as we're wrapping up here, coming on 50 minutes. So again, we wanna thank everybody for hanging on today. A great audience, a great presentation and a great team um, that we've built with Global Trans here at the Plastec Group. Um, if you do have any questions, um, audience members that you want to kind of chew on and submit. We do have all three of our contact information there listed on the slide with our email addresses. Um, and then you can jot those down and send those over. There will also be, as I switch to the next slide and we close out, an opportunity for you to submit your interest if you're looking for more information specifically in a post-webinar survey. So as you exit out of today's webinar, there will be a pop-up window that gives you that opportunity to give us some feedback um, on the presentation, our program, and uh, future opportunities to come see you guys um, again in our audience. So we do appreciate the time that you take for that today as well. And also think of the Plastic Academy of the logistic path to help you maneuver through the industry. Uh, we've got a great panel of presenters and experts that we've had throughout the last couple years. So um, take a moment to share those and, and view and register for our next um, upcoming up webinar. So we've got direct defense, uh, cybersecurity and Brassum with the market outlook for raw materials. So we want to thank Global Trans again today. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Sun, and everybody at Global Trans, um, James and Sarah, who also helped us out along the way. Um, it's a pleasure working with you. And until next time, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.